Great, I think we can start. So hello everyone, wherever you are. Welcome to this webinar on what role should central banks play in dealing with environmental and social challenges like uh, climate and inequality. My name is Danny Bradlow. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Pretoria and on behalf of the project on public finance and human rights, it's my pleasure to, to welcome you to this, um, to this event. Um, I just want to say uh, the project on public finance and human rights is a collaboration between the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria, the Business and Human Rights Initiative at the University of Connecticut, and the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law at American University Washington College of Law. Um, this is the next in a, a series of uh, events we've been holding over the last couple of years on this general topic. Some of them have been about central banks and human rights and some about financial regulation and human rights. Uh, we've also done some publications on uh, uh, global financial governance and, uh, and uh, the issues that that raises. Um, I, to, to begin this, in 2015, Mark Carney, who was then the governor of the Bank of England, made a speech in which on, on climate change and financial stability in which he talked about the tragedy of the horizon and how that was stopping financial regulators and monetary policy and central bankers from dealing with climate change because it, the impacts of climate change were always just over the time horizon that they used in uh, making their planning and their regulations. Today, six years later, the tragedy is no longer over the horizon. The tragedy is being felt directly by many of us in our lives and, uh, and the way in which uh, the world works today. Um, so that it's no longer a question about whether uh, financial regulators and central banks should be uh, addressing or considering issues like climate change and inequality. The question is, how should they go about uh, doing that? What are their roles and responsibilities in this regard? I, I don't think there's anyone who thinks that central banks is the answer to these problems. But the question is, what role should they be playing in regard to that? And I, I would say two things we've learned from that. One is that climate change is not just a question of carbon emissions and managing carbon emissions. It implicates biodiversity, uh, water and land pollution. It has consequences for issues like inequality and migration. And so that it, there's a broad complex of issues that are really climate change in some ways is just a shorthand for, for talking about some those sets of issues. And I would say that the second question is how should central banks begin fitting these issues into, um, uh, into their monetary and financial stability policy uh, policies? And in a way, there's two ways or two aspects to that question. The first one is, is how does climate change and inequality affect monetary policy making? So should they be incorporating those as factors in their, in their models and the, their decision making procedures? And the second one is, how do their policies affect climate change and inequality? So what responsibilities do they have for measuring the impacts of those and managing those impacts in, in some way? Uh, these are all obviously very complicated questions, difficult to answer. And so today we've assembled a really wonderful panel to talk about these issues. Um, and to, to, as I, we've said, is to try and stimulate a debate amongst them and amongst with the participants about how we can discuss this. Um, to introduce the panel, I want to uh, invite my co-moderator and collaborator in, in the Public Finance and Human Rights Project, Stephen Park from the University of Connecticut to, to, uh, to speak. So Stephen, over to you. Thank you, Danny. Uh, well, first of all, welcome. It's a real pleasure to host this event and welcome all of you. Um, as Danny noted, uh, Danny and I have been working together for several years on a host of questions that intersect uh, public finance, uh, human rights and sustainability including, of course, central banking, but also uh, international financial regulation writ large, uh, development finance and sovereign debt. And uh, certainly we hope that all of you attending this event uh, will join uh, this group of uh, scholars and practitioners and advocates and ad activists and policymakers that we hope to assemble and develop and foster uh, towards addressing uh, these important questions. Uh, with respect to the topic of today's event, uh, we're tremendously pleased to have this um, absolutely 
wonderful group of knowledgeable and insightful leaders uh, as practitioners, advocates, and researchers on the question of uh, central banking. And as you can see, uh, the group that we have here today uh, comes from uh, <clears throat> any number of different countries um, and academic disciplines and areas of study and practice. And I'd like to take a moment to uh, very briefly introduce our speakers before we uh, formally begin. Um, we're first joined by Elzi Awadzi, who currently serves as the uh, second deputy governor of uh, the Bank of Ghana, uh, the country's central bank. And uh, Elzi will be uh, shortly um, beginning uh, the, the, uh, the discussion that will follow. Uh, we're also joined by Aldo Caleri, who currently serves as the senior director of policy and, ca and campaigns for Jubilee USA. Welcome, Aldo. Um, and also by uh, Daniela Gabor, who is a professor of economics and macrofinance at the University of the West of England uh, at Bristol. Um, Daniela followed your work, and it's really a pleasure uh, to host you. Um, we're also joined by uh, Rosa Lostra, who is a professor and the Sir John Lubbock Chair in Banking Law at Queen Mary University of London, who, like all the others um, on this panel, has engaged on this topic uh, through a variety of different fora. Um, next, we have uh, Christina Skinner, who is an assistant professor of legal studies and business ethics at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and writes extensively on central banking and its intersection with financial regulation. Prior to joining the faculty at Wharton, uh, Christina served as legal counsel at the Bank of England. And so she, of course, has firsthand experience seeing these questions. And last, but certainly not least, uh, we're joined by Uli Voltz, who is a professor in economics at SOAS University of London, and also was founding director of SOAS's Center for Sustainable Finance. Uh, many of you have come across uh, Uli's uh, vast writings um, on sustainable finance over the years. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Uli and uh, the entire panel for today's event. So without further ado, I'll turn the floor back to, to Danny uh, to, to start with the discussion. Great. Thanks, Stefan. Um, and just one uh, instruction. So as we said, the, the goal is to make this as interactive a discussion as possible and also to have an opportunity for, for uh, participants listening in to uh, engage as well. So if you're a participant who wants to ask a question, please use the Q&A function and we'll try and integrate those as many of those questions as possible into the discussion as we go forward. Um, as I said, we, we sent a group of questions to, to the, the participants in the round pay table um, and we're going to try to get it through as many of them as possible. The first question we asked was, are environmental and social challenges relevant to all, for example, the monetary, financial stability and regulatory functions of central banks, or only to some as aspects of central banking? And if so, which aspects are, are relevant? Um, and Elsie Ado Awadzi uh, volunteered to, to very graciously to be our first speaker. So Elsie, let me hand over to you to, to answer our first question and get the discussion going. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Stephen, and all the uh, organizers behind the scenes. And um, this is an incredibly interesting topic. Um, my answer, my short answer will be yes. Yes to all of the operations of a central bank. And I believe that you, you did refer to the remarks that Governor Kani at the time made in 2015. Um, that sparked a whole conversation around the world. I think since then, we've come a long way. Uh, and there's less argument about the fact that um, environmental and social risks are key, uh, are key factors that affect the work of a central bank. And um, I say this really for my own personal views and for my understanding um, of how central banks uh, go about their work. Uh, so let's take examples. I mean, the, the issue of environmental risks, right? And as you describe it, not just climate change, but you know, the whole spectrum of pollution and, 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 and the works. Um, we're seeing already how these are impacting, um, you know, the economies of nations, right? Either because you're seeing extreme weather patterns, 
uh, you're seeing pollution of, of water bodies and the displacement and the loss of livelihoods this causes. Um, you're seeing how, like I said, extreme uh, uh, weather patterns are, in, are interrupting the production cycles of agriculture uh, and the like. Um, we're seeing increasingly how countries that are dependent on the extractives industry are finding it difficult to raise capital in international uh, markets to be able to even produce these reserves of, uh, of, of whether you call it um, uh, minerals, hydrocarbons, and the works. And, and many countries' GDPs depend on these. Um, and so it has become, I would say this has become more uh, macrocritical than we, we thought was the case before, um, particularly for small countries, you know, and, and, um, and even for large, I would argue. And then if you add on um, how all of these factors I've outlined um, can create problems for, for growth and output um, and, and really how that transmits through prices uh, of goods and services and how that impacts um, inflation and, 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 and really the work that central banks uh, are mandated to do. And then if you look at the social side of things, um, which largely uh, relates to exclusion, exclusion from, from full participation in the economy, either because of structural barriers um, or because of policies that really produce unintended consequences. And therefore you find that growth sometimes uh, countries are recording growth by looking at GDP numbers, but uh, growth is not broad based enough uh, and is really focused on a few, uh, you know, large corporates, for example, in the real sector. Um, and so the idea is how can we become more aware uh, of, of the social disparities that exist, the income disparities, uh, weaknesses in the job market that keep many people outside the job market. Um, a big issue has to do, when I think of social uh, challenges, um, a big issue has to do with financial exclusion and the fact that the financial system tends to push out uh, or keep out some of the most vulnerable groups of society. Um, you know, the marginal, marginalized groups like women uh, entrepreneurs, youth entrepreneurs, um, you know, micro, uh, small and medium sized businesses, which really are the bedrock of most economies. And, and so for central banks, I think the time has come when um, they need to understand how these um, seemingly um, exotic uh, ideas you really impacts their day-to-day -day work uh, and how they can make their policy more effective. If, if you take the traditional mandate of a central bank uh, to promote price stability, uh, it then makes it very imperative for a central bank to understand how all of these risks really impact what they seek to achieve. Uh, most central banks also now have a financial stability mandate um, explicitly enshrined in law. And it's important to understand how environmental and social factors really work against the objectives of promoting financial stability. Um, so I would argue that it cuts across uh, and, and there's so much I can go on to say, but these are introductory remarks. Uh, I'm happy to continue to weigh in on this as we go along. Thank you. Great, thanks Elsie. Um, I. Rosa. Um, yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, ah, there you are. Okay, yeah. Here I right. am. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think there is no doubt that climate change and sustainability are the fundamental issues, not just for central banks, for governments, and also for international organizations in the 21st century. The, the question that arises, like I said at the beginning, is not if, but how. And central banking has always been dynamic throughout its history. And one of the things that we have witnessed in recent decades is that while for a while up until the global financial crisis, there was a consensus, there was a period of consensus that central banks should be aimed at the primary objective of price stability and do it with the main instrument of monetary policy, that model, has been disrupted first with the global financial crisis that showed that central banks could not ignore the risks to financial stability. And then 
after the global financial crisis, as central banks started to use unconventional instruments of monetary policy and extended substantially both the mandate and the balance sheet of the central banks, we were confronted with an emergency, the pandemic, COVID-19, something which we are still feeling the effects. That's what we're having this Zoom conference. And, and obviously, parallel to all of that, we have the, the climate change. And as you say, it's not just the climate change, it's biodiversity, it's the whole green and blue agenda, or the issues also of financial exclusion that, that Elsie referred to. There are the issues also of social sustainability. And the issue is how do you combine effectively several objectives and several instruments within the central bank without losing track of the primary mandate? Because of course, governments have a role through taxation, through legislation, through, re through regulation to confront climate change. And central banks, there was this book, The Only Game in Town. Central banks cannot be the only game in town. So, so the issue is one of aligning objectives and instruments. And I, I think it's a very pertinent issue. The, the network for the greening of the financial system that central banks have started also shows that this is, this is not just a national problem, this is an international problem. So one issue that one should wonder is the extent to which international organizations or the international architecture should reshuffle itself to tackle these, these enormous challenges of our days. When the Bretton Woods institution were set up in the 1940s, there was with a different set of priorities. The big issues of our days are the issues that we're discussing today in this panel. So the answer is obviously not just at the national level by national institutions, including central banks, but also at the international level. And whether any of the existing agencies or a new agency should be mandated and other countries or countries around the world should give up sovereignty in order to tackle what effectively is a global problem is also something that central banks need to take into account. Just very briefly, because we have, uh, you have assembled a fantastic group. Let me just say some of the efforts that central banks around the world have already done. In the, in the, in the Bank of England, in, in, in the budget this year, in, in March 2021, a specific climate change mandate was added to the, to the mandate of the Bank of England as part of the secondary mandate of the Bank of England. So something that the central bank, the Bank of England needs to do in, in, in addition to, to the primary mandate of price stability and also the mandate of financial stability. Again, the issue is how. I was part of uh, an inquiry uh, that the House of Lords conducted into the QE program of the Bank of England. One of the issues is green, green QE. You know, should the, should the central banks a favor credit allocation, pick winners and losers, which is a very big issue in terms of market allocation. But there is, there is a debate, which I think we're starting to have today, and I'm, I'm glad that you and Stephen have had uh, the, the foresight of doing that. How do you do that without actually really picking winners and losers? Do you use monetary policy or do you use supervision? There was, during the inquiry, most people that gave evidence to the committee suggested that it should be done most via supervision. And we can discuss that later in the second group of questions. How can supervision be adjusted rather than continue to expand monetary policy and the balance sheet of the central banks and expanding the kind of blurring the contours of what constitutes monetary policy and you know, constitutes fiscal policy. The, the ECB is also has conducted a major strategy review. The ECB takes sustainability as part of the secondary mandate. The secondary, man the primary mandate of the ECB is very clear, price stability defined by the treaty. And the secondary mandate is, is very broad. It includes everything that you have said and even more things, even you know, broader issues of inequality and child protection is, is, is a very, very, very broad mandate. And so the issue now is again, how do you reconcile the narrow mandate of price stability with the broader mandate which comes through sustainability, but also crisis management. Central banks have become crisis managers against the global financial crisis, against COVID, now against the climate change. Are we overextending the mandate of central banks, which after all are technocratic agencies, or should the government do it itself? So I think those, those are more questions than answers. And let me just say briefly that the US is also tackling this, and you know, I'm sure Stephen and Christina can say more, but I was reading as I was just thinking about the subject today, the, the statement that, that Chair Powell uh, gave on the Financial Stability Oversight Council report on climate-related financial risk. And it, it says that they, they, with the creation of a supervision climate committee, 
and a financial stability climate committee, uh, they are working like every other central bank, like we are doing to understand better and how to address the, the climate risk related for financial institutions and the broader financial system. So we need to understand what are the risks to price stability and what are the risks to financial stability. I mean, we are starting to see inflation, green inflation and all sorts of inflation through the supply chain, not so much in the developing countries, but in the advanced economies. And obviously inflation and stagflation, they're also very dangerous and it has been proven in the past that the central bank is the best institution to deal with those immense problems that uh, an economy stuck in stagflation can, can face and, 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 and can be challenged with. So I think that as, as a starting comment, which is really opening even in a broader way the horizon, but also looking at what the specifically is being done. So the, the network for the green financial system incorporated the money in the Bank of England, the ECB reviewing how to pursue the secondary mandate and broadening the, the, the spectrum of issues that it takes into account, both in monetary policy and in supervision. And the Fed also, I think more reluctantly, the Fed, though the Fed has the broader mandate because it has growth, employment, price stability and financial stability as part of the mandate. So to me, it seems the Fed is the one most reluctant of the big three central banks that I have referred to to embrace what is certainly the biggest challenge of our day. So thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing what all the others have to say on, on what is, as I said, a fascinating um, set of issues. Thank you. Thanks, Rosa. That, that was very helpful in setting it out very well. And I think sets up uh, for Christina to respond to you um, in, in a, from one perspective, at least. So Christina, over to you. Yes, well, thank you for having me here. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Indeed, it does um, sort of set up my remarks, I think. So I am on the sort of other side of this debate. I think I'm going to offer you a different perspective. And generally, in general, I've been looking at the Fed's mandate and how far it can actually stretch to address these various issues. And so the bulk of my remarks is going to be very much focused on the Fed and very concrete about what is the Fed's mandate and how far can it go. And I think as a starting point, it's very important for us to understand that a central bank is not a monolithic concept. Each central bank around the world has its own very specific legal framework embedded in a very specific democratic or constitutional system. So are these challenges relevant for the Fed? Well, yes, of course, they're relevant for the Fed, like any other exogenous issue. So if there is a concrete impact on price stability right now, that's not hypothetical, then yes. If there's a concrete impact on financial stability, then yes, it's relevant. And that is very much the tact that the Federal Reserve has been taking. Now, to preview some of my remarks that I think we'll get into later, you know, in the case of climate change, you know, to be clear, the Fed has been proceeding slowly. And this isn't because of reluctance. It is truly because there is not a discernible link in the U.S. economy right now to price stability and climate change. In regard to financial stability, which the Fed does not have an explicit mandate for, only an implicit mandate, which is very different from the Bank of England, right? If you look sort of concretely at banks' balance sheets, you'll see that they are, or at least appear to be quite resilient, right, to climate shock. So in response to Powell's comments and the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which I really want to get into later because there's a really interesting dynamic between the executive branch and the central bank there, you'll see that Chair Powell and the Fed in general has committed to engaging on a supervisory front. And I think that distinction is really important when we sort of flesh out these comments down the road. So in the case of being in a defensive or responsive posture. Yes, of course, the Fed has all the standard tools that it has to fight crisis, to monitor for safety and soundness on a bank's balance sheet, to deal with financial stability risks in the way that it has to fight other kinds of crises that are tripped from exogenous shocks or events of volatility. 
But in terms of whether the Fed has a mandate to go on the offensive, right, to proactively address these issues, it just doesn't have the legal authority to do that. And this is absolutely no commentary on the substantive importance of these issues, right? It's just sort of focusing very specifically on what is the mandate of the Fed and also thinking about these big picture questions that surround the rule of law, the separation of powers, the legitimacy of the Federal Reserve and its independence. So if we you know, think about it from that perspective, then we can sort of start to sketch out some very real limits on the Fed stretching its price stability mandate to go on the offensive, right? Or its employment arm of its mandate to go on the offensive to address problems like inequality. So for one, right, as you know, Paul Tucker has written extensively in his book, right, the central bankers, including the Fed, they're wielding unelected power, right? So there's very little democratic legitimacy for the Fed to stretch its mandate and decide, right, to redefine those mandates to go beyond, right, what our democratically responsive institutions have told the Fed to do, right? Moreover and related, it's a, it's a very slippery slope. Once you start putting the Fed in the position of responding to political branches or popular pressure, right, then the central bank policy tools are sort of at the whim of the party in power, right? And we'll get to this a bit more later. And third, there's very practical concerns, I think, about resources, right? Central banks' resources are invariably limited, and they can be stretched and they can be snapped, right, when we sort of push them into many different arenas. And then, you know, third, Having a central bank leviathan, as I've called it in other writing, where the central bank, a collection of unelected power, has responsibility for making decisions, as Rosa pointed out, about who gets credit in the economy or who doesn't. And I think, again, this is just a preview for what we'll get into later, right? That's really anathema, in particular, to American society about picking winners and losers outside of executive branch authority. And so, you know, I think it's important to consider two things. For one, there are a range of incredibly important economic and social issues, trade, immigration, economic relationships with China. They are not all issues for the central bank to incorporate within its mandate. Second, there are a wide range of structural problems in the economy. But at least in the United States, these structural problems are not for the central bank to address. Those are fiscal problems for the executive branch to try and tackle. And so in the United States, where we have this robust separation of powers between the executive and the legislative branches, we try to be very careful about taking things that are the job of the executive and giving them to the central bank or pressuring the central bank to circumvent Congress and wield that unelected power in place of elected power. So I'll leave it there, sort of teeing up lots of different things I'm sure people will ask me about later. Great, thank you, Christine. Christina, that was uh, definitely sets up a lot of interesting issues for discussion. And I, I think Uli, um, I could see was, uh, I could see his mind ticking over as you were talking. So, so let me hand it, the floor to you really to 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 speak thank you denny uh, uh thank you denny and uh first of all thanks a lot stephen and denny for for having me really great uh, around here um maybe let me start by saying that uh i think it's great that on on the question you know are environmental social challenges relevant for central banking that fundamentally there isn't really any disagreement anymore everyone agrees on that and this is quite notable i would say uh, so I started working on, on central banks and um, uh, green finance climate stuff a decade ago. And the conversations I was having with central bankers back then were very, very different. And now we really uh, are in a position where uh, central bankers and supervisors very broadly uh, accept that they have to deal with these issues. And the big question, of course, now is what exactly does it mean in practice? And this is where kind of things get more tricky and where, of course, divergences arise in use. And, and uh, we've just heard from, from Christina, kind of a, an American perspective, not the only American perspective, but one uh, American perspective. Um, and I, I would uh, say that, first of all, uh, very clearly, climate change, but also uh, other environmental issues, biodiversity loss and so on, and of course also social issues, um, have very, very profound implications on our economy. So we can't really uh, understand our macroeconomy uh, 
uh, without uh, carefully studying the impacts. And um, I would like to emphasize that this is not just an issue for developing uh, emerging countries where we know physical impacts of climate change are already worse, but uh, we've been conducting recently a study looking at uh, inflation in the Eurozone, where we could actually show that already now um, uh, climatic events have been having significant impact on inflation in the Eurozone. So very small effects, but detectable effects. So, um, and with climate change getting much worse, of course, uh, the impacts will be much larger going forward. Uh, so price stability, you know, the core of central bank mandates uh, is, is very directly affected. Uh, and of course, there has been a lot of focus on climate related financial risk uh, and a consensus that this has to be addressed as well. Um, and now the question is really, what should central banks do? And uh, most, if not all, would agree you know, we, we uh, uh, central banks, supervisors need to uh, mitigate risk. So there's a lot of discussion about uh, climate disclosure. Um, uh, central banks, supervisors are conducting stress tests to identify the vulnerabilities and so on. Uh, so this is all very uncontroversial and, and you know, kind of the, the new consensus, uh, which is great. Um, but the question then is, how should that uh, impact on, on prudential uh, policy uh, and here we, we have um, uh, right now still a lot of central bankers who say, well, um, we need to be cautious. We don't fully understand the effects and so on. Um, others, including myself and also others on this call, I know uh, are, are, are pledging for a, a kind of precautionary approach uh, because the risks are so enormous. And um, we know climate change is happening and it will have very profound impacts on our economies. So the time to tinker around at the margins is, is uh, long past. And of course, uh, central uh, kind of governments uh, need to play a leading role. Um, so carbon taxation, industrial policies, all kinds of uh, uh, policies need to be taken by governments. Um, but it's also very clear that um, without profound changes in our financial systems, we're not going to tackle the problem. And the institutions that govern finance are central banks and supervisors. And so we do need central banks and supervisors to take a strategic approach to climate change, but also other environmental uh, uh, issues. And this doesn't mean that they have to solve everything, uh, but they have to do two things. One is they have to uh, look carefully how uh, these different developments are impacting on um, the economy on the financial system um, and, and uh, try to, to um, uh, mitigate any uh, potential risks and so on. Um, but then also uh, they need to uh, support the uh, kind of a proactive response that we need in our economies, in our financial systems uh, to align uh, finance with sustainability. And when we talk about climate, uh, the Paris Agreement is very clear. Article 21C uh, uh, demands that uh, finance should be aligned uh, with sustainability. Um, and this is not going to happen by itself. And uh, so we do need uh, really central banks to, to signal very clearly uh, from financial institutions uh, that they expect all financial institute, uh, institutions to be aligned with climate goals, also other sustainability goals. and. Uh, one thing I would like to, to emphasize is that uh, this notion of market neutrality, which long guided uh, uh, central banking and, and kind of uh, central banks operations, uh, this is really an outdated concept. And uh, the good news is that uh, an increasing number of central bankers are acknowledging this now. So financial markets are very heavily biased towards uh, 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 carbon, um, financial markets are, for the time being, still pumping trillions of dollars or euro or whatever, South African rand, into uh, uh, all kinds of dirty activities. And kind of taking a neutral approach means perpetuating the status quo. And the status quo is clearly not sustainable. So 
we need central banks to, to make clear that they are not going to perpetuate, but that they kind of accept uh, that finance has to change and that they should request um, through all kinds of tools, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, uh, that uh, financial institutions align their operations with sustainability. And very, very final point, um, there is this important concept of double materiality. So it's one uh, issue kind of how institutions, including the central bank, uh, is affected by climate change. So what is the impact of climate change, other environmental risk uh, for the central bank's balance sheet, for example. And of course, they also need to maintain, uh, uh, kind of uh, make sure that their own uh, balance sheet is, is kind of, um, that the risks are minimized there. Uh, but also very importantly, uh, what is the impact of their own actions? And uh, central banks who um, uh, say uh, conduct quantitative easing uh, policies with a heavy carbon bias, you know, they're perpetuating the system uh, as we have it right now. And uh, you know, all the regulatory prudential policies that they're taking uh, are also having an impact. So um, we need to have uh, uh, this double materiality perspective, and with this, I'm going to shut up. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. That's um, very helpful. Uh, Daniela. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so after such distinguished speakers, um, it's kind of a challenge to see how to, to take it from there. So let me try to inject a bit of debate and disagree at least with a couple of the of the previous speakers. I, I find it more difficult to disagree with Uli because we're coming kind of from the same direction, but I will try. So I, I picked up from both Professor Lastras and Professor Skinner's interventions two words, and I want maybe to, to discuss, well, two expressions, and I want to discuss a bit the, the differences in how we think about what central banks should do by looking at these two expressions. For the first one is picking winners, and the se second one from Professor Skinner was exogenous, as in the climate is an issue exogenous to the central bank. And let's start with the question of picking winners, right? The way in which Professor Lastra constructed it was to suggest that central banks should not be in the business of picking winners, or as Professor Skinner put it, it should not be in the business, or central banks should not be in the business of allocating credit. But if we think carefully through a climate lens, the central banks are already picking winners, and that is the, a very significant problem. Central banks are picking winners in the sense that central banks are uh, continuing to provide credit to uh, or to support financial institutions that provide dirty credit to uh, high polluters. Uh, another way of, of, of saying that central banks are implementing a principle called market neutrality to which Uli Volt um, uh, uh, just referred. And because central banks decide to close their eyes at this, this very process of, of picking winners, in my view, they are implicitly um, um, accommodating in an allocation of credit towards dirty activities. And if you think very carefully about what central banks do, they have a relationship with the financial system, right? And by, by arguing that they are not picking winners, what they are doing is in a sense, they are saying, well, if there are climate problems, we will, we will rely on the market to generate a response to that. And if we think very carefully, well, what does the market do or what is the historical experience of what the market has done so far in terms of, uh, of um, the climate crisis. So financial markets under, uh, underprice climate risks. It's very difficult to see in prices of financial instruments, deliberate pricing of climate risk. This is, we know from the European Central Bank, the, the Bank of England, they both recognize that precisely when they try to respond to critiques that, that they shouldn't be picking winners. But financial markets don't, don't just uh, underprice climate risks, they also contribute to the climate crisis, right? Because they lend to uh, fossil fuel activities. And there are so many examples of this that we could bore you until tomorrow with just uh, re uh, presenting one after the other. And I think a, a third point that we have to bear in mind when we, we think about the concept of picking winners is that because for the last five, five to six years si since Mar Mark Carney made that famous speech that uh, Danny Bradlow referred to, there is a turn towards green in the, in the private financial system. And this has come with a lot of greenwashing. And by greenwashing, I mean financial institutions pretending that they uh, issue green credit when they continue to lend to dirty activities and magnify the challenge of the climate crisis. So if we have these three sort of points in mind that, that financial markets continue to lend and uh, to dirty activities, and if central banks do not intervene, they are de facto Picking, them, um, picking those dirty lenders as uh, winners in the allocation of credit, 
that financial markets do have an influence, an impact on the climate crisis, and that they are engaged in systematic greenwashing, then I think we should be more open to the question that credit allocation is already happening in central banks, that winners are already being picked, and central banks have a responsibility to deal with that. I think, um, and I'm, maybe I will finish with it with this, I wanted to discuss a little bit the concept of double materiality, and this matters. It's a very technical term that, that is used in the central banking and financial community debate. And the double materiality says you can't only think about the relationship from climate uh, change or from climate events to the balance sheet of financial institutions. You have to think the other way around as well. You have to think about the carbon footprint of, uh, financial, of the financial system, the way in which it decides uh, which companies to uh, give credit to. And but in, in, the, uh, in the logic of the intervention of Professor Skinner, what I heard was the kind of logic of single materiality. It says, well, if there are risks to the financial system, if there are risks to balance sheet, then the, the Federal Reserve should worry. But otherwise, we cannot. There, there is a question of democratic mandate at stake. And uh, we, should, we should be very careful uh, uh, to allow technocrats to, to go into this uh, territory of uh, a, a much more broader democratic discussion that should be uh, resolved by uh, political authorities. The problem with that argument, again, is that central banks are already in that space. The climate change is not exogenous to the central bank activities. Climate, climate change is not exogenous to the financial system for which, which the central bank uses for monetary policy, uh, um, for the transmission mechanism of interest rate decisions, but also uh, for, for financial stability. And I wanted to finish by asking, by, by hoping that the um, um, Madam Deputy Governor will respond to, to a, a particular doubt and, and question that I have, which is that in, in um, low and middle income countries, I think central banks are, are faced with an additional um, challenge, which is that they have to try to recognize how uh, climate finance that is coming from uh, financial institutions in, located in the global north, to what extent this makes things better or makes things worse? How do we recognize the contribution that uh, um, climate finance from donors and from private financial institutions makes to, um, uh, to or, or, or whether that contribution improves or, or worsens the climate crisis? Uh, and I want to give here the example of Total, the French uh, oil company, uh, which has, um, and I think this is something that we should discuss more carefully. For example, uh, the Total in Congo has argued that it should be allowed to exploit new oil reserves because it has a um, nat nature-based solution. It has a nature-based unit that promises to sequester some of the carbon dioxide that it will uh, generate by exploiting fossil fuels. But if you look at the, the, the details of how it's going to um, sequester that carbon dioxide, what we see is going to destroy a lot of biodiversity to put in place a commercial wood ex uh, um, uh, exploitation or, or uh, a farm. So I think th these are the, we, as we're getting into the politics of what green central banking means, we have to uh, consider more carefully, not only the legal constraints, but the, but the material reality of the relationship between uh, central banks and the financial system and, and how that is affected by climate. Great, thanks, Daniela. Uh, you've definitely got the, the ball rolling. Um, I know both Christina and Rosa would like to respond to you and you've given a question to Elsie also. But before doing that, I wanted to give Aldo an opportunity to, to join the conversation, particularly because Aldo, you come from a civil society organization perspective, so a different perspective from, from the rest of the group. So let me hand over to you and then we'll go to Rosa, Christina and Elsie to respond to Daniela's questions and then we'll take it from there. Thank you, uh, and uh, it's such a pleasure to, to be part of this conversation. And uh, there are so many things that uh, I, I uh, wanted to say and other speakers have said them already that were reactions that I also had uh, when we were looking at that question. Uh, so, but for the record, and this is, I think it's a consensus, even though I come from a different perspective, but I, I think just like everybody, you know, it's, it's not a question of uh, if at this point or whether, uh, environmental and social challenges are relevant, but how, no? And I think that's, a, uh, it's, at this point, that, you know, it's very difficult to, to, to disagree with, with that. Uh, now you can take different issues. You can say, you know, climate, perhaps 
and I, I think the judgment about how these issues are relevant also evolves with time and with the, you know, as knowledge, uh, you know, as authority gain knowledge about certain issues and, and our knowledge develops. And if you would have taken a picture of 10 years ago and uh, the links from climate to all of these tools, the monetary, the financial, the, the, the uh, regulatory, uh, it, it would have been a very different sense. Huh? But, but I think now we can see that even if you think about a very narrow uh, mandate of a central bank from a perspective of price stability, financial stability, how all of these issues are relevant, how in developing its monetary policy, the central bank has to consider risks that are inevitably going to come from a changing climate. And I think we have had a lot of examples of that presented by the other uh, speakers. So, um, so the, I think there, there is a distinction here to make about, um, uh, perhaps there is a lot more consensus on a, how bank, how is it relevant in the sense of risks that central bankers have to take into account as part of their job, as narrowly as that a mandate may have been defined. No? And, and I also uh, acknowledge here, I think it's a very good point by Christina, that different, this, in every country, there is a different constitution and a legal system that regulates what the central bank itself can do. No? And if people want to change what the central bank uh, 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 does, you know, that an act of Congress or of parliament in the different countries can change that. That's, you know, it's the, the, the charters are set. And, you know, in some cases it's embedded in a constitution which can also change with the required majority. And we are seeing constitutions being reformed in different countries. So, but, you know, to acknowledge that it happens within that framework, within a framework of, of uh, law and, and, and domestic uh, regulation. Um, so perhaps it's less controversial when one thinks about the risks that the bank has to take into account, the central bank has to take into account, compared to when one thinks about the central bank policy as an input to try to change those outcomes. I think that's where a lot more controversial issues arise. Uh, and uh, I, I think one, one really needs to be more careful because sometimes monetary policy or what the bank can do with its portfolio management can, can be a lot more blunt tools to try to achieve outcomes. And, and also central bankers are trying to balance different outcomes you know, and, and, and you know, doing those trade-offs. And they need to, to think about that. You know, one, uh, there's a lot of literature now, for example, about quantitative easing contributing to inequality, right? But we shouldn't forget that when the central bankers were doing quantitative easing, they were also trying to respond to another challenge. And you, know, you need to balance uh, the different outcomes and, and sometimes with limited knowledge no so uh, that's I, I think we need one, one needs to take into account all those aspects and that's why um, it, it will be inevitably a, a judgment that the central banker will make in its own context and, and given the circumstances no uh, about that what are the what are the tools to what extent to to, to intervene now when we think about this aspect of uh, what are the tools and the, the policy of the central bankers as an input into to, to achieve those outcomes? Uh, I, one thing that comes to my mind is also that uh, we shouldn't forget uh, the central bank is one of the tools the state has. As technocratic, uh, as, te technocratic as, as it may be as an agency, it's still a tool of the state. Um, so in this sense, uh, I think it's important. This cuts both ways, huh? cuts, cuts two ways. One way it cuts is that it's not the only agency the state has. So there are other tools, there are other agencies. One shouldn't put everything in the shoulder of the central bank when there are things that other agencies should be doing. Um, but it also means the central bank is part of the team. No? So if there is like a political project, even a technocratic central bank, I think cannot really ignore the political project that the government is trying to move forward. And, and I think the central banks do feel that pressure and, and you know, a lot of the movement we see is, you know, regardless of central bank independence, they realize they are in that reality of a political project in certain countries. You know, if a country is saying we want to move to net zero in 2030, you know, a central banker cannot just say, well, well, let the other agencies do that. I'm just going to focus on my mandate. It's a, you know, a sense of we have to think also what our contribution can be uh, but of course, it's a judgment that 
in each case has to be made, you know, framed by by the by the legal uh, uh, mandates that, that that the banks have, and and you know, on the basis of the knowledge that the central bank will also have in, in each case. So that that's what I will say so far. Thank you. Great, thanks, Elda. Um, just before we we start the next round, I see Uli has put a a paper that he thinks um, that looks interesting called Net Zero Central Banking, a new phase in greasing the financial system that sets out the positions of central banks on, on uh, in the environmental climate change issue. The link is in the, the chat box for people who, who are looking for that. Um, I, I, can, uh, I said we'd go Rosa, Christina, uh, then Elsie, and then Uli. Um, I, one of the questions that came struck me as I was listening to to all of this, which I, would, I want to add into to this discussion as all of you start speaking, is um, is it just the question of different central banks have different legal mandates, and that's the differentiation from between them, or is it that maybe the the role of central banks varies according to the level of development in a society, the size of the economy, uh, how open it might be to the global economy. And do we do we really need to think that all central banks should be doing the same thing, or is there more room for differentiation than we we've recognised uh, in the past? So if, if you if you want to add to address that in your response as well, um, let me. But we'll go Rosa, Christina, Elsie, and then Uli. So Rosa, over to you. Thank you very much, Daniel. I think your question is very relevant in the sense that central banking has always been dynamic. I mean, they're creatures of history and as such, their mandates need to be adjusted. And if at the moment the mandate is not aligned with the times, then it should be changed, it should be revised. And there is an issue there of legitimacy, not just independence, legitimacy and accountability, which is very important. And so if we want to make climate change part of the mandate as the Bank of England has done in 2021, it's better to make it explicit. And then to also decide how are you going to achieve that mandate and which are the instruments that you have in order to achieve that mandate. So I'm very much in favor of, of um, incorporating climate change in the financial sector, both for the regulator and for the regulated institutions. It's a matter of how do you do it? I, I was, a, a, Daniela gave evidence to the House of Lords Committee in which the quantitative easing program of the Bank of England was examined and one of the conclusions is that it actually exacerbates inequality because those that have assets have the value of those assets increase. And quantitative easing at the moment is 40% of GDP in the UK, is 30 and 32% in the US and the Euro area and 166 no, 106% of GDP in Japan. So to continue to expand on QE is a very dangerous thing. So the report that the House of Lords published was QE, a dangerous addiction. So we need to be careful about what we are wishing for. So I want to say that my picking winners and losers is to say that we cannot continue to do it via quantitative easing. I don't think so. I think the size of the balances have hugely expanded. And I think that what started as an instrument to unclog the bank lending channel in 2009, and uh, then to address these functional bond markets in 2020, March 2020, has become really a measure to support the economy. And the issue is whether we are starting to blur the contours of what constitutes uh, depoliticized monetary policy and what constitutes a perfectly legitimate politicized, that's what politics is about, fiscal policy. And whether those that is something that is governments that should pick winners and losers via the tax, carbon tax, and via other measures, rather than trying to delegate in central banks without, unless they make the, the, the very explicit mechanisms of accountability in order to to, to get legitimacy. I mean, we have already green inflation. I mean, with, with, with the, there have been a number of studies that, you know, part of the inflation that we have. So we need to, to look at those things. And let me just say that I, um, and, and we can continue to discuss this later. I think the best instruments for the central bank to address um, the, the, the issue, not just of climate change, but also just sustainability much more broadly, social, environmental, and economic sustainability, or much more in the field of micro and macro prudential supervision. Macro prudential supervision, I always say, kind of making a legal analogy that micro supervision is like a court of first instance 
macro supervision is like a court of appeal and monetary policy is the Supreme Court. I mean, it's obviously a very imperfect analogy, but macro prudential supervision sits between monetary policy and micro supervision. And I think it can be used more effectively than some of the instruments of monetary policy, given that we have already um, a return of inflation in the advanced economies. And I also think that we need to be much more creative with micro supervision. We have been talking about the stress test, but I would suggest to, to just change the whole supervisory system to incorporate this. For instance, to have internal ratings like the CAMEL systems, CAMELs at the moment looks and, and equivalent in other countries, capital assets, management, earnings, liquidity. Every single aspect of the balance sheet of the central bank and the way that supervisors look at it should actually look at the issues of sustainability and climate change, capital, management, assets. So I think you know that we need to look, I, I, I'm kind of moving a little bit from monetary policy to supervision to the extent that the central bank has supervisory responsibilities, whether micro and macro. And then I want to say just one final point, as many of the speakers, uh, sorry, some of the speakers and certainly many of the listeners are from the developing world, and that is that for developing countries, for central banks in developing countries, what you were saying before, Danny, makes a lot of sense, kind of reaching and harmonized standards of what central banks should do. And also bear in, 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 in mind that at the moment, particularly after COVID, the external debt problems, that's a different issue of, of many of the developing countries, are becoming very severe. And, you know, lacking fiscal space, that's something also that obviously central banks need to take into account in those economies. So here the issue of crisis management goes you know, a bit broader than, than simply some of the issues that we have discussed. And we're talking there about economic sustainability. So again, and, and this I'm brainstorming, I think debt sustainability assessments of the IMF should be just changed also to incorporate climate change, to incorporate these types of sustainability. So we need to, we need to rethink the whole system of surveillance, debt sustainability assessments, and just incorporate across the board a mandate of climate change, and then come with a specific measures, a specific suggestions of regulatory standards and ratios that can be used across the board. And, and I'm all for harmonization in the light, or, or in, not in the light, in line with some of the things that you, Danny, and you, Stephen, have already put forth in some of your papers. So I will stop for now. I just wanted to clarify what I meant by not picking winners and wizards, linking it very important to the legitimacy. And I haven't even talked about central bank independence. We can talk about it later. So I think I'm up next. Uh, yes. So thank so Rosa. Uh, so uh, thank you, Rosa, for that because I I uh, really just want to emphasize. Uh, the importance of, you know, Professor Lostra's excellent comments on democratic accountability and legitimacy. I mean, these are issues that we should be discussing front and center alongside, you know, whether central banks have the mandate to do it, sort of, where do we go from there? And also, you know, I just want to reiterate that we should absolutely pick up later this really important distinction between monetary policy and supervision, because that very much impacts the sort of runway that a central bank has, both legally and normatively. But so um, I'm, I'm happy to follow in the wake of your remarks, but I wanted to make, I guess, three specific points in response to some of the excellent points that were made by the other panelists. So the first, I wanted to respond to Yuli's comments about the marketplace, basically. Um, and I want to sort of uh, push back a little bit on a couple of points that I think were made in terms of um, sort of the markets being stuck in, 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 um, in, a, in a loop that's unproductive for the climate change problem. So I'm not so sure about that when I look at the U.S., marketplace. So I have a paper that I recently published with a colleague of mine, Sarah Light. It's called Banks and Climate Governance. It just came out in the Columbia Law Review. And we basically look at the initiatives being undertaken by the U.S. banking sector. So the systemically important U.S. banks in the space of climate governance, right? The private sector voluntary initiatives that haven't been regulatorily mandated or incentivized, right? Sort of through these soft nudges. And two things. So we sort of list out the very the range of efforts that banks are undertaking to facilitate a transition to a low carbon economy. And I draw some analogies to the ways in which the US banking sector has facilitated other massive industrial structural 
transformations in the U.S. economy. So that's one point. The second, so and and I and I and I think it's you know easy enough to sort of disparage this or cast it aside as greenwashing. But I think we don't we don't really know that yet. I think it's premature to say that, oh, these are just greenwashing. I think we see significant commitments from the banks. And I think it's a bit unfair to prematurely judge those as inefficient or as lacking. Second, if you actually look at the and I'm just talking again about the U.S. case, if you look at the balance sheets of, again, the U.S. SIFIs, you'll see that they are seven percent or less exposed to the biggest carbon producers, right? As a matter of their entire balance sheet, 7% or less, and that's declining year over year. So I think, again, you see actually concrete sort of objective measures of the banks reducing their portfolio of loans to heavy carbon producers. You also, of course, in the US see massive movement on the equity front. So bank lending, you can think about the debt side, but there are billions of dollars flowing into green technologies, green investments from the asset managers that want to sort of put green dollars to work. Again, we can say, you know, maybe it's genuine, maybe it's greenwashing, but I really think it's premature to prejudge those initiatives. So I think at at the very least, there's massive movement happening on that front. And I also sort of wanted to push back, right, against this notion that banks, that there's there's this dirty credit that banks shouldn't be lending to, right? Or that the asset managers sort of shouldn't be putting their dollars to work in in certain portfolio companies. And that's sort of for two reasons. I think sort of from a technical standpoint, I think most of the evidence really tells us that we we do need fossil fuels to build that bridge to transition, right? And we're not there yet. So there's some amount, I think, of lending that you know, probably has to happen to facilitate facilitate that technology. But perhaps a more, you know, important point, maybe you can disagree with me on the technology there or not. But the fact of the matter is, is that if the banks debank the fossil fuel producers, someone is going to lend to those companies, right? It'll be the non-bank sector, it'll be the bond market, water is going to find its level. So then we may have financial stability risk of a different kind. So my point is not that we should sort of keep, you know, full steam ahead, you know, lending to coal companies. My point is just that we need to take sort of a big picture view about what the private sector is doing and also think about what the consequences of debanking certain industries will be for financial stability risk writ large. My second point, um, and I'll try not to go on for too long, is in response to this conversation we've been having about picking in winners and losers. So that too, I want to push back on in terms of the Fed. You know, I would sort of roundly disagree that the Fed picks winners and losers as a primary objective. Okay, if you look at the way that it injects credit into the economy, consider it's 13-3 facilities. So when there's a financial crisis and the Fed is lending to banks or non-banks, right? It all of its facilities in the tw- in the 2020 and then in the 2008 crises were entirely sector neutral. They were published. They were done through sector neutral indices or other um, ways of ensuring that the lending was again completely neutral. So the primary purpose of that lending had nothing to do with the industry. Okay, and when the when the Fed also lends through its discount window, that's in Section 10B of the Federal Reserve Act, and um, again. The Fed is entirely agnostic as to what banks use that money for. I will say, I'll give you an interesting anecdote. In the 1920s, there was an experiment that was tried. It was called a direct action policy. And at that time, the board was really worried about banks borrowing through the discount money to fund speculative lending because we saw the stock market bubble brewing and the Fed wanted to try and do something to sort of tamp down the bank's ability to borrow money and then finance speculative loans. After years of debate around this policy, it was essentially abandoned as unworkable because money is essentially fungible. And because from a sort of normative standpoint, the central bank said, we are not in the business of policing what banks use the money for. Now, I'm just sort of giving you a historical anecdote. You can take it for what it is. But I think the point is, the Fed has not historically and does not today pick winners and losers as the primary aim of its policies. 
If the Fed were to shift to a position where it was saying banks, you may lend to these industries, you may not lend to these other industries. My point is only that that would be a major departure from the way that we have done central banking heretofore, which would indicate some kind of need for additional legal authority. And so this brings me to my final point that I think was raised by Rosa and Aldo also. I completely agree that central banks are creatures of statute, right? And they are organs of the state. And so my point is not that the central banks can, can, cannot ever do this. My point is always that they don't presently have the legal authority to do so in the US. And so I guess sort of closing the loop on Rose's point, you know, we would need our democratically responsive institutions to give the Fed the mandate to address some of these important social and economic issues that it does not presently have, right? It sort of all wraps up in this point about the rule of law and democratic accountability. Great, thanks. Um, so uh, I have a, a long list now, Elsie, then Uli, then Aldo, then Daniela. But before handing over to Elsie, I just want to tell people, uh, I hope you're looking at the chat box because there's a lively debate going on in the chat box. And also equally importantly, um, a number of people have put references to various articles which um, uh, can help people uh, after this, but with some very useful and interesting sites. So Elsie, over, over to you. Thank you, Danny, and um, very interesting discussion so far. Um, I just want to reiterate my earlier remarks. I mean, I feel that in many instances, these risks are macrocritical. And obviously, um, you know, the level and the extent of it would depend from country to country. And uh, I, I can't pretend that it will be the same for everyone. Um, I can I can just say that already we're seeing it uh, happening. Like I said, there are countries whose GDP is wiped out completely because, uh, you know, of uh, you know, natural disasters that are occurring uh, more often than not. Um, countries in the Sahel region of Africa, whose complete uh, production for the year from agriculture is wiped off as a result of severe droughts and all of that stuff. So it's real for countries and for some countries it's critical. Um, this leads to the issue of whether, I think Christina's point about whether central banks should adopt an offensive stance or a defensive stance. I think every central bank needs to decide how, how much of a shock these risks could play out to be uh, and how this could impact their work and basically what they can do to make this work within, of course, the mandates that, that they have. Um, I think one thing that we that we haven't talked about much uh, right uh, in this discussion is also about the level of development of the financial systems in a given country. Um, some countries tend to be more market based in terms of their financing arrangements. Some depend almost entirely on their banking system. And so the question is, given the massive uh, market power that banks have, what role could they play? You know, to 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 sort of um, uh, on a more offensive, uh, in a more offensive way, to forestall future uh, disasters, you know, and, uh, and and the risks and the shocks that these pose to the entire economy. Uh, and so, I, I really and I totally agree that this should be country to country. Although I also agree with was it Rosa's point about international cooperation, uh, because we need while priorities are national. Uh, there is also international priorities on this. And I think that uh, we should, we need more international cooperation to help sort of um, tease out these issues and, and, and find solutions to them. I definitely think that although central banks are independent, they don't operate in a vacuum. Uh, many central banks, although have a primary objective of price stability, also in their establishing law are very clearly asked to do that in the context of economic policy and, and, and growth and other policy objectives. Um, and so it is imperative for central banks to think of how they complement the efforts of, of the fiscal authorities or, or other authorities dealing with structural issues. Um, the idea is not for them to take over the work of other institutions or agencies of government, but to complement. Uh, the central bank at the end of the day has the singular um, uh, mandate of promoting price stability and financial stability in many regards. Even for, even for central banks don't have an explicit uh, financial stability mandate. Many of them understand that without, without financial stability, you can't really achieve price stability. And so most of them would also 
work on that objective as an ancillary one. Um, and so it's really important that we think of ways in which we can complement the efforts of other agencies and not wait until the problems really come to roost. Um, the, this leads me to what central banks are, are doing. And Rosa points out what the major central banks like the Bank of England um, has done with a very clear explicit object, uh, mandate uh, amendment uh, from, the, from the chancellor. Um, you do have other central banks that don't have an explicit mandate in this regard, but are taking the view that it is their responsibility to understand fully how these risks will play out um, and to try and forestall as much as possible these risks materializing. Ghana is a, is a case in point where the Bank of Ghana in the year 2019 launched what we call the Sustainable Banking Principles. Uh, it's a set of seven principles um, designed along ESG principles and basically banks, we expect banks to comply with these. It's in the nature of soft law. Uh, so these are not hardwired law. Um, and let me say that we developed the, these principles together with the Environmental Protection Agency, um, as well as with the banking industry itself, with the Association of Bankers. And so these principles uh, that the banks have, have voluntarily um, you know, adopted, but these principles came with a push from the regulator, are saying that the banks will ensure that their own carbon footprint is reduced. It's also saying that they would use their market power to promote a greener a transition to a greener economy. And it is saying these principles are also explicitly saying that the banks uh, will promote financial inclusion, will promote gender equality and other social uh, objectives, right? Um, and then these principles require the banks to report um, on a quarterly basis to us as a central bank on compliance with these principles and also publish uh, the extent to which they're complying or explain. And so this is our small uh, effort at this point, uh, you know, using our supervisory authority and our moral suasion uh, and convening power, we have started this process and the banks are doing this. You know, they've developed the internal mechanisms uh, for making sure that they're complying with these principles. Uh, we believe that the banking sector has a responsibility for the, towards the entire uh, economy, uh, given the massive power that they, they, they wield. And we as a central bank have committed to applying the same principles in our own operations uh, to show leadership. This is just one way. Many other central banks uh, are issuing, at least issuing guidance to the banking sector, uh, you know, and making them more aware of what they can do. Um, and, and then also going ahead to incorporate these in the stress testing models and others. We're not that far gone in terms of incorporating these in our stress test models, uh, in our you know, microprudential toolkits and all of that. Not just yet, but at least we're doing something. Um, so it seems to me that every country needs to do what they can do. Uh, we're not about to make up a decisions at the Monetary Policy Committee based on how we think climate change is, is, is occurring already or not. But definitely we recognize that our work uh, at the Monetary Policy Committee, uh, our work in terms of financial uh, regulation must very clearly identify these as risks and track and monitor these risks, measure their impact, uh, and if possible, use whatever tools we have available to try to mitigate these risks uh, occurring. And um, I believe that every country would have to do what they can do uh, within the accountability frameworks that they, they have available to them. Thank you. Thanks, Elsie. That was extremely helpful. I've, you've, I've got tons of, but in the interest of time, I'm not gonna ask them now, because um, I know this. So next is Uli, yeah, over to you. Thank you. And I must say it's, uh, it's been a real, pleasure listening to Elsie and I, I, I would really like to applaud her because this is exactly the kind of central bank leadership that we need and we don't need it only in Ghana but we need it everywhere and I'd like to address a couple of points that have been made uh, by, by different uh, colleagues um, so and, and also the question Danny you asked on you know basically does one size fit all obviously not um, each country is different every economy is different every financial system is different 
um, the mandate of, of central banks and supervisors differ. Uh, so context matters a lot. Um, I have been for a long time arguing also outside this kind of green sustainability context that uh, having, you know, kind of a, a one size fits all approach to central banking uh, as for, is, for example, suggested by the inflation targeting framework uh, is really uh, not, not the right approach. Um, so there are different traditions and within these traditions, central banks need to operate. And, uh, you know, we have been uh, seeing uh, you know, interesting approaches in different uh, Asian uh, countries, for example, with respect to uh, addressing climate environmental risk. Um, you know, I, I would uh, not really dare to, to take uh, exactly these approaches to, say, uh, the National Central Bank of my home country, Germany, and propose to the Bundesbank that they replicate what Bangladesh has been doing. So context matters a lot. Um, but I think um, it is very clear uh, and also Elsie just uh, emphasized now, but I think basically everyone has emphasized, you know, it's very clear that climate change, uh, other environmental risks have very material impact on our economies and our financial system. So in one way or another, all central banks have to deal with it. Now, again, the question is how? And uh, I, I'm always a little bit irritated that in the year 2021, we're still having discussions around, uh, say, green QE. I mean, Green QE a couple of years ago was raised by some people, you know, by, by some uh, campaigners and so on, who, who had long dropped this demand. Um, this is, in my view, really a red herring discussion. And it's mostly brought up by people who want to undermine uh, in the credibility of the discussion. Um, I don't know anyone, uh, you know, who's to be taken seriously who's asking for Green QE, but I know a lot of people. Uh, who, including myself, to the extent that I know myself, uh, who are demanding that if central banks engage in QE, can they please do it in a way that is not heavily biased towards um, uh, 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 the high carbon sector? And so this goes back to the uh, question of, of double materiality. Yeah? Uh, what is the impact of uh, central bank policy? all of them, monetary, uh, uh, prudential, uh, uh, other like reserve management and so on. Uh, what is the impact? And colleagues have emphasized that, um, you know, central banks should not have to do everything. You know, central banks are not the prime institutions to save the world. Yes, I agree. Uh, but again, you know, I know a few people who are actually asking central banks to, to solve the climate crisis just by themselves. But what central banks need to take into account are what are um, government policies, national goals, and to what extent should they either actively support them or at least not undermine them. And again, this is uh, very much uh, depending on, on, on the specific context. Um, so in the European uh, Union or in the Eurozone more specifically, of course, um, as was mentioned, uh, the European Central Bank has a clear primary mandate where I would also maintain that uh, uh, climate uh, change and other environmental risks clearly has a direct impact, but the secondary mandate, uh, and here uh, it's very obvious that um, uh, kind of uh, climate agenda, the net zero agenda that the European authorities have not only adopted, but put into law, it's EU law, the net zero transition, that the ECB, uh, with a mandate to support economic policies of the European Union, has to support these policies, uh, uh, condition, of course, on not undermining uh, price stability mandate. Um, but there are other cases, of course. Um, I, I put in the chat a, a paper on, on central bank mandates, uh, but to the extent that all central banks are really responsible for price stability, financial stability, uh, there is not a single central bank uh, that can ignore it. Uh, and a lot of central banks actually have some kind of secondary mandate. And we have now around 130 countries that have adopted net zero targets. Uh, so these are government economic policies and central banks should not undermine them. And, uh, you know, regarding uh, policy or kind of instruments, again, the green QE discussion is 
it, it, it's very uh, kind of unnecessary. Um, I saw that Daniela put in the chat uh, uh, some, some comments about uh, collateral frameworks. You know, these are the things we should be discussing about. Collateral frameworks, uh, uh, you know, it's a very boring technical issue, but this has enormous implications on, on how markets are, are working. Um, you know, capital requirements and so on. You know, these are the things we need to discuss, uh, not green QE. Um, and so, you know, this whole picking winners uh, discussion, I think is, 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 is in a way missing the point. Um, central banks indeed should not pick winners, um, but they need to uh, uh, stop being kind of ignorant on what's happening in the financial market. And, you know, there should be rules that apply for everyone in the financial market. Um, and the rules should not uh, kind of support the financial system that for the time being is leading us to ruin. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Christina, uh, you mentioned, well, we still need uh, fossil fuel investment. No, we don't. I mean, the International Energy Agency, which is not a hippie left wing uh, institution, um, but which traditionally has been very supportive of the fossil fuel sector, uh, really made very clear that we, we need to immediately phase out. And I would also very much like to emphasize, because uh, you know, this is co-organized by the University of Pretoria. And um, you know, we, we, in, in a developmental context, um, you know, there's of course always the question, oh, but you know, can developing countries afford to phase out fossil fuels? Uh, can they afford climate action and so on? I would very, uh, very much maintain that uh, developing countries, emerging economies cannot afford not to uh, 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 take a, a firm climate policy. Um, and for example, we also should be talking much more about uh, financing uh, uh, climate resilience, adaptation and so on. Yeah? Um, uh, we, we had uh, um, a little bit of, uh, there was a little bit of touching on, on social questions. When we talk about climate change, who are the most vulnerable people? Well, uh, the poor. So uh, with colleagues, I've put forward a concept of green inclusive finance. And central banks can play an enorm enormously important role in promoting green inclusive finance uh, that will help um, households, micro, small, medium enterprises to better adapt to the climate challenge or kind of environmental change more broadly. And so kind of, uh, these are things that, that actually a lot of central banks in the global south are working on, um, and, and these are also important parts of this whole uh, discussion. Uh, again, I'm talking too much, but <laughs> so, so interesting discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Uli. So we, we've got about six minutes left. So um, Aldo and Daniela, when you make your comments in response, now make also use the opportunity to make your closing comments, and then we'll have a round of closing comments from the other speakers, and then Stefan and I will close out the, the discussion. Um, so Aldo, over to you. Yes, uh, well, the conversation sort of moved on from when, that, when I wanted to intervene, but I, I, I really wanted to go back to the very interesting question you raised, Danny, about the room for differentiation, and uh, that takes me back to uh, I think there is a lot of room for differentiation. Uh, uh, I agree uh, that, uh, you know, not a different differentiation in the if, no? like we, I think we all agree that the if is not a question, but in the how there is uh, an enormous room. Uh, and, it is be, and it is not just because of the legal system. So the legal system is a part of that, you know, uh, and I think uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the definition of the, the mandate of the bank that comes from the legal system. But there are other ways in which the legal system will impact, I would think, what the central bank does. For instance, if you have laws passed uh, banning the financing of fossil fuel projects, for instance, I could not imagine that the central bank would continue to have in its portfolio, uh, you know, it's just, it would be a lack of due diligence to, in its portfolio to continue to have assets that may be in violation or in breach of that law, you know. So there are other indirect ways in which the legal system can influence or impact what the central bank does in addition to how it shapes its, its actual mandate. But also the, the differentiation in the sense of the social contract in the country where the central bank is based, you know, and that will also be different. And there are central banks where they may need to do more about inequality simply because it's just inevitable, you know, in the, in the, in the framework in which they are operating. If, 
there are questions of inequality that sometimes can rise to the level of really creating a, a level of social conflict that could be a real problem for financial stability. No, uh, so the central bank could have to consider that. And then the question I raised before uh, the issue of the, the political project in that country, no, uh, and what the contribution of the central bank can be to that. Uh, and, and you also talk about levels of development, and I think that is an important aspect also to, to uh, because levels of development not only will impact what sort of risks the bank has to assess, the central bank, because some things that may not be systemic in certain countries may be systemic in others, right? Even when we were talking about biodiversity, I remember in this Einstein quote about the bees, no? And if, if bees uh, uh, disappear, the man of the humankind will disappear in four years, no? And, you know, it doesn't need to be so catastrophic, but there are certain countries where uh, the disappearance of certain species can be really quite systemic uh, or pose problems that a central bank would have to address, even if it's not about climate change, you know, just biodiversity per se. So I, I think levels of development matter in that sense. And levels of development also matter in the sense of uh, this issue of what is the team of which the central bank is part, no? This set of state tools, because in some countries you may find that the other tools, now saying don't put everything on the back of the central bank, in some, especially in, in many developing countries, you'll find that a lot ends up in the back of the central bank simply because some of the other agencies are too weak to carry the burden, which may not be the case in, in more developed countries, right? And, and, and I think that is sort of an important element to, to consider. And, and that a central banker, I think, would, would consider normally when making decisions, no? Uh, like, so, so what, what is our role here in the sense of what are the things that nobody else is going to do? And, and I think uh, Elsie really touched upon that uh, very well when she said, you know, the massive power they realize that they, they have in the economy in a country like Ghana, which maybe is not the same massive power in, in other countries. And I will finalize uh, with another uh, aspect of this uh, differentiation, which uh, goes back uh, in, in, uh, to, to the paper you wrote, Danny, about the uh, a, a international rules for central banks, uh, in the sense that we also have to differentiate that what the central bank in a developing country does uh, would be very would have very different impacts outside of that country than what a central bank in an advanced economy does. And actually, we have no way to resolve this at the at, at the moment. There aren't like rules really establishing how a central bank that has very systemic impacts worldwide should take that into account. No, because the, it tends to be like a domestic policy decision. And I think in some way these global considerations do somehow, you know, it can never be totally impervious to those uh, uh, global impacts, but there isn't like an explicit recognition, I believe at least, of uh, what the advanced economy central bank mandate should consider about dimensions of their decisions that reach outside the country. And this may have implications because we are talking about the global challenge like climate change. So what central banks uh, can do in an advanced economy also in terms of that global challenge is, is, is I think, another important aspect. Uh, so uh, I plug for your paper there, uh, uh, which I, I think uh, touches upon that uh, those dilemmas very, very nicely. Thank you. Thanks, Aldo. So I, I've been a terrible time manager. I see we're already at 10.30. I mean, if I can ask everyone's indulgence for another 10 minutes, and then we can have final statements from, from everyone, beginning with Daniela, um, who can you also have time to to respond as well. So Daniela, over to you, but please be succinct. So we, it's no more than 10 minutes that we need. I will not take 10 minutes. Just to say um, that, I, I, in a sense, I agree with Uli that the, the debate around um, picking winners, in a sense, feels dated, perhaps because in Europe, we've been talking for far longer about what does it mean to move away from, from central banking status quo. But just to clarify, when you argue, as several of the panelists have, that central banks should not be picking winners, what you're saying is that financial markets work perfectly to allocate credit where they should be. And if you think about the climate crisis, we know very clearly, and central banks in Europe, but in many other countries, have recognized that financial markets do not work well, do not work, uh, they fail in allocating credit because they give too much credit to fossil fuel companies. 
So on that basis, when we discuss moving away from this framework, it doesn't mean that we give them additional mandates, it give them, we give them additional powers, we create democratic deficits. It recognizes a state of affairs that needs to be corrected if we are to continue to have well, a climate and, and, and countries to live in. Uh, so I think that's, that's very important to clarify. This is not, a, to my mind, this is not an extension of, of mandates. I think it's also important to clarify that central banks, particularly in, uh, and, and you can take the example of the Bank of England, because I think it's quite instructive. Central banks do not say, of, uh, well, we will, give, we will, or we will trust uh, financial institutions that they are not greenwashing a lot or that they are not going to continue to uh, lend to fossil fuels. What they're saying is we're going to put in place a framework through which we can uh, ensure that when we lend to commercial banks and, or to, and to financial institutions, we do not accept bonds, bond collateral that uh, uh, is issued by polluting companies. And we, put, we have to monitor this with trans transition plans. So when Professor Skinner says that, well, there are transition plans and we need transition, central banks are already thinking about that, but we need a much stronger hand of the state because so far we have relied on the market to, de to, to sort this problem and, and the financial markets have exacerbated the climate crisis. This, I think, is a pretty uncontroversial un un statement and therefore we cannot rely on them. And the idea of greening the collateral framework of the central banks that they use in order to decide on what terms to give uh, uh, loans to banks for the functioning of the financial system, that is not credit allocation, that is simply correcting a market failure that is already embedded in the operations of the central bank. We don't want central banks to make the same mistakes that the pr private financial system is doing for a variety of reasons that have to do with price stability and financial stability. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Daniela. So, I, Rosa, I can see you have your hand up. So I let's have, go to I, you. I had my, my hand up from before. Since these are the, the final remarks, let me yeah. thank you also very much. I mean, this is a fascinating thing and we could be talking for hours. I mean, central banking, I wanted to pick an issue that you put to us also as part of the, of the, of the questions we could discuss, and we have not discussed it very much, which is the issue of central bank independence. Central bank independence became a very useful institutional arrangement in the 1990s, and it was embedded in many legislations and promoted by the IMF and many others as an agreement, or as an arrangement that facilitated the pursuit of a price stability oriented monetary policy because inflation and stagflation had been a major problem in the 1970s and governments felt like Ulysses at the mass they needed to delegate the pursuit of a price stability oriented monetary policy to an independent central bank. Obviously that edifice of central bank independence or central banking with an arrow mandate is now changing. And what I think we need Central banking has always been at the intersection between economics and politics, and it remains so. But a broader mandate, a set of mandates, by definition, is much more susceptible to politics and politicization. But if that is what we want, then it should be made in a legitimate way. So it might be that you need, we need a new social contract on economic policy. Separately, I mean, and, and just just. To clarify, I'm actually part of another initiative with the Scotia Group, in which I support fully the transition to net zero, helping both developed and developing countries achieve it. So if the future is green, blue, I would also add inclusive, digital and international, we need in our new social contract on central banking to incorporate those elements. And whether we like it or not, that also needs to be reflected in the law in order to give it legitimacy and to establish adequate mechanisms of accountability. Because central banking, as I said at the beginning, was and remains dynamic. There is nothing in central banking that is sacrosanct. And therefore, central banking and the mandates need to adjust. But we need to recognize this thing, that the, the mandate that was given to central banks proved to improve their credibility. And one of the issues that those that still want to defend that narrow mandate suggest and, and, and consider is that that credibility as inflation fighters might be affected with an overextension of the mandate. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rosa. Um, so Christina and then Elsie for, for final statements. 
Yeah, so I'll be quick. And so thanks again for having me and to all the panelists. I think it's a really fun and enriching discussion. So, you know, I guess I would just reiterate the point that I've made a few times, which is it's it's really important to be distinct, right? There's room for differentiation. Think about the particular legal frameworks of each central bank. And also to think about the particular function of a central bank for which under which we're examining. And at the end of the day, I think that we are probably not all that far apart in terms of what the central bank can do. And, you know, I want to sort of leave off by saying that, you know, I, th I think the rule of law constraints are incredibly important, but also that it is the case the Fed is not burying its head in the sand and that it is considering climate risks. And at the end of the day, it may well be that the Fed does actually have um, a good amount of room to address problems that are in the here and now. So in terms of price stability, right? I mean, if we're really concrete about it, when we have inflation or deflation, when we have price instability, right, the Fed will react with monetary policy regardless of the cause, right? And that's sort of what I was saying at, when I was referring to climate as an exogenous issue that can enter the Fed's mandate. When price stability is impacted, the Fed can react. And the same is true of unemployment, where we, where we diverge is again, if we were to use those tools to try and proactively right, make changes in the economy to intervene in markets, which would be very different from the Fed's role here too far, and so would, would require congressional intervention. In terms of supervision, which we didn't really have time to talk about that much, but which Rosa mentioned, you know, that's a different ballgame from monetary policy. Right, the Fed has a more flexible standard under the safety and soundness um, construct in the Bank Holding Company Act and in certain provisions of Dodd Frank, which is why you've seen the Fed focusing on microprudential supervision first, right, to sort of think about where climate can be entering its existing mandates. You know, the final point I would make about these legal structures, um, which I think um, Yuli raised, is a really important distinction. The Federal Reserve, unlike the Bank of England, unlike the ECB, does not have a secondary mandate to have regard to the economic policies of the government. And so, in fact, if you look at the history of the Fed and how its mandate, how the Federal Reserve Act was created and how it evolved, our unique breed of central bank independence is actually sort of by definition prefaced on this strong separation between the Treasury, the executive and the Fed, right, which is a completely different situation. And so I think that's also going to explain some of the reasons why, right, we can't expect the Fed under our current framework to be catering to the economic policies of the government. Again, that would be something that would have to be changed um, by Congress. So at the end of the day, I think you, you, you do and you will see the Fed moving on the supervisory front, but monetary policy is not something that it would entertain, except for when climate affects its, its mandates in the way that I've described. Um, but I still think there's plenty of really good work that the Fed can and will be doing in this space with what it has. Great, thanks, Christina. Um, Elsie, over to you. Uh, thanks, Danny. Um, I recognize I did not answer Daniela's previous question. So with the indulgence, I'll, I'll be very quick on that and then I'll wrap up. Daniela, so your, to your question, I mean, we, we don't have any means of verifying uh, the extent to which internal capital inflows, uh, I mean, foreign capital inflows um, are green enough. And I'm not aware of what standard we would be using if we were to do that. But in the context of the sustainable banking principles that we've issued and the fact that we expect banks to make disclosures uh, in terms, first of all, of the ESG risks that they face, as well as what they're doing to mitigate those risks on a proactive basis. If a bank tells us that it's, um, it's tapped into pools of green finance uh, you know, from foreign markets that it's using you know, to help finance its green loan portfolio or other assets here, we do expect that to be truthful. And we do expect that it provides all the necessary disclosures in terms of sources and all of that for the market to be able to, uh, to verify. So that's, I hope that's clear. That's, that's really what we, we plan for now. Um, but let me wrap up by saying thank you, uh, Danny and Stephen and, and my co-panelists. This has been a very uh, uh, enriching discussion and I've learned a lot. Um, just to add, to end, I would say the transition to a green economy is happening on us now. And, and, and it's happening faster in some places than others. Let me say that events are also um, 
making this happen sooner than later. Um, of course, recently we've heard about courts in Europe um, asking big oil producers to cut their production uh, within a year or two. We've had courts telling um, shareholders to do something uh, about their, the, you know, their dependence uh, on, on not so green sources of finance and all of that. This is already happening. And my fear is that if something is not done uh, to manage, adjust uh, and an orderly transition to a greener economy, um, things could get out of hand and the, the, the effects would be felt in the financial markets and financial system more generally. And this will be a big problem for central banks. And therefore, this is clearly something for central banks to get proactive about in thinking through how this is going to play out and how they can position themselves as well as their financial systems uh, to get ahead. Um, lastly, on social, uh, economic and social exclusion, um, I would say that uh, you know, it's, you know, the risks are growing, particularly in the midst of the current pandemic, where the impacts of the pandemic have been disproportionately felt uh, by marginalized groups. We don't know when the pandemic is, is ending and how, how, how it's going to play out in, in the months and the weeks and the years ahead. Um, when all is said and done, we hope to have emerged out of the pandemic stronger and more resilient. Uh, and I do hope that central banks get into uh, the mix very quickly in terms of helping to think through ways in which the recoveries could be uh, stronger and more just. Uh, and more robust in terms of how broad-based and how inclusive they are. Um, that's really the future. Anything else is, um, is really trouble for all of us and central banks in the end are blamed by everyone uh, you know, for letting the people down. When prices are not stable enough, when financial systems come crashing, it is central banks will get the blame for it. So I, I think we, we might as well get involved in helping to think about these things proactively and doing something about it to complement the efforts of other, uh, other government uh, agencies, obviously. Thank you very much. And it's been my pleasure being here. Thank you. Um, Uli, I can't remember if you had a chance to make a final statement. Do you need 30 seconds to say something or you, you feel you've done your bit? Well, if I, if I get these 30 seconds, then, then I'll, I'll greatly accept them. Uh, well, first of all, thanks so much. It's been really a fantastic discussion and, and um, uh, I wish we had more time. But so I think the main point I want to say uh, to make is that uh, as guardians of the financial system, uh, central banks and supervisors really need to make sure that finance is aligned with the climate goals and the other sustainability goals. And they need to take a very strategic stance on that. So they, they have to position themselves to kind of taking a market neutral stance will not do. Uh, for sure, you know, uh, every central bank has to look carefully uh, uh, what they can do within their mandates, but there are a lot of tools they can use, and it's certainly not all about uh, QE or green QE. Uh, there are a lot of different prudential tools, monetary policy tools, um, uh, reserve asset management, and uh, if I may uh, emphasize that also, Elsie uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, moral situation, you know. Central banks really should send out clear signals to the markets what they expect. Um, and uh, so I think central banks really have a key role to play, certainly not the only one, but they can uh, complement and, and, and um, kind of catalyze uh, government policies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank everyone for a really rich discussion that's uh, very thought provoking and uh, going to give me lots of um, food for thoughts going forward. Um, I, I wish I could say, because it's clear we've just scratched the surface of the topic, and I wish I could say that this was part one of a multi-part discussion and that these same wonderful speakers would be coming back another time to, to go on with the discussion, but unfortunately, at least as of now, that, that's not the case. Um, Why not? I, well, we can, we're, to, be, to, to be continued, a discussion at least. Um, I, I, the one thing I take away from this, though, just, I mean, it's so many lessons, but the one thing is, it makes me realize how little we really understand about how to integrate environmental and social issues into the ways in which finance and um, economic issues are actually dealt with. I mean, it's not unique to central banking that you see this. It's, it's in many areas that we, we're learning how the, the world really has to change if we're really serious about dealing with environmental and social responsibility going forward. 
Um, and so I think this discussion um, is a good beginning to that, but hopefully we can take it forward in, in many different ways. So I want to, to thank everyone, particularly the speakers, for, for a really wonderful discussion. I want to thank the participants for, for sticking with this. Um, and I apologize for not getting to some of the questions which I know are here, um, but uh, it really has been a wonderful event. I, I also want to thank um, our tech team behind the scenes, Yolanda Boysen, Tandeke Rasitsoke, and Gina Noval um, for, for all the work they did on this. And finally, for the last word to hand over to, to my co-conspirator in this project, uh, Stefan Park. So Stefan, over to you. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Well, uh, first and foremost, thank you to all, all of you who've uh, attended this event, and of course, to our fabulous speakers. Uh, this really was a, a provocative and informative, and I think truly promising uh, discussion about the wide range of issues that I think are of concern to all of us. I'll just confess, as uh, Danny intimated, that uh, among the questions that we shared with our speakers uh, prior to the event as part of the agenda, uh, we only got to a small portion of them, which to me suggests that, in fact, uh, this is indeed the beginning of what I think and I hope will be an ongoing conversation. Uh, and, and of course, uh, as a final takeaway, I'll just um, reiterate what I think is a commonly shared sentiment, which is that, in fact, these issues are as timely and urgent and as important as ever before, but that the tools that we have at our disposal that we, in fact, understand and agree upon are still in their infancy. And so uh, I encourage all of you, um, those of you in attendance and, of course, the speakers, to continue following the work of this project. Follow us on Twitter, uh, uh, by email, and, uh, and, and please, uh, we look forward to seeing you at future events. Uh, thank you all and enjoy the rest of your days. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.